Well, good afternoon. Uh, part of the reason I asked to skip the bio is the bio is personally embarrassing for me. I did not do all those things. I, I am not those things. And, and I think Adam wrote it, and, or Todd wrote it. And it's just, uh, and, and considering this is either my fifth or sixth midwinter, I think most people know who I am by now, and they don't need to be reminded uh, of, of whatever it says in the bio. But um, before we begin, I'd like to start with a moment of personal privilege. In 1994, in the fall, two guys started working at the Texas Education Agency on the same day. And these guys had never met each other before, and they were placed in the same cubicle, their desks facing each other in a very small cubicle. And over the years, they became great friends and colleagues. And they had been through many ups and downs together. And um, truly, truly a remarkable human being. Adam Jones, would you please stand? Adam has been a friend and colleague of mine for all of those years. And he has since decided to leave the Texas Education Agency next month. And I just wanted to say thank you, Adam, for your service. And for all of you who may not know Adam, if your FSP payments showed up on time, if you were able to log into TEA's website, if your interaction with the agency was anything other than flawless, it is Adam Jones' work and his team who are responsible for that side of the house. And so I have had the utmost confidence in Adam, and, am, and I signed his letter of resignation with regret. But I wish him the best and thank him for his service to the state of Texas. Thank you, Adam. I'm gonna to try to do things a little bit differently this year. And I'm gonna start with a book that I've been reading. I was asked to read this book, and it's called Carrot Sticks and the Bully Pulpit. And it was written by a guy named Fred, uh, Rick Hess, great guy, and Andrew Kelly. And this book, details the history of the involvement of the federal government in education. And as I read through the book, I was actually asked to provide a quote for the back cover of the book, and I'll, I'll read you what I wrote. Carrot Sticks in the Bully Pulpit is a must read for any lawmaker who wants to understand the history of the federal education policy and its implications for our schools, as well as for any teacher who wonders why the classroom they entered with optimism and hope has become so mired in paperwork and bureaucracy. Now, you may sense the sarcasm in that quote, and you may think it was directed at the authors. It was not. It was frustration with myself and the complicitness that I had in creating this system and the system that we have in the state of Texas. Because as I was struggling to understand the complexity of this federal system and the state system and all of the layers that we have added onto it, it, it frustrated me, and I sense it frustrates you as well. And I tried to figure out how I would explain it all and what we were really trying to do and what really was our point. And in, as I became more and more frustrated, I came across an article. And as I read this article, it clarified things for me so beautifully. And I want to read you a few passages from this article. This article appeared in CNN over the weekend. And it was about a young divinity student who was working as a student chaplain in a cancer hospital. And her professor asked her about her work. And she said, I talk to the patients. And he said, you talk to the patients? What do people sick and dying want to talk about? And he did, he, she didn't really think about this. And he said, do you talk about God? And she said, not usually. Do you talk about religion? And she said, not so much. The meaning of their lives? Sometimes. Um, and prayer? Do you lead them in prayer or ritual? And she said, not so much, really. And he said, well, what do you talk about? And she said, well, they talk mostly and I listen. And he said, talk about what? You literally send, spend these times with these dying individuals and you sit there and listen to them talk about their families? And she said, yeah, and the professor went to class the next week and, and derided the student while she was sitting in class and said, this person's depth of spiritual knowledge is limited to a discussion of family. And the student felt a little bit ashamed. And 13 years later, after she had been a chaplain for many years, she, she contemplated that's absolutely what we talk about. And I want to read you some of this. Mostly they talk about their families. They talk about their mothers, their fathers, their sons, and their daughters. And if my voice cracks when I say, speak this, it's the allergies. It's the cedar, OK? <laughs> they talk about the love they felt and the love they gave. Often they talk about the love they did not receive or the love they did not know how to offer, the love they withheld 
or maybe never felt for the ones they should have loved unconditionally. They talk about how they've learned what love is and what it is not. And sometimes, when they're actively dying, fluid gurgling in their throats, they reach their hands out to things I cannot see and call out to their parents, mother, father, dad. People talk to the chaplain about their families because that is how we talk about God. That is how we talk about the meaning of our lives. That is how we talk about the big spiritual questions of human existence. We don't live our lives in our heads, in theology or theories. We live our lives in our families, the families we are born into, the families we create, the families we make through the people we choose as friends. We don't learn the meaning of our lives by discussing it. It is not to be found in books or lecture halls or even churches, synagogues, or mosques. It is discovered through acts of love. The first and usually the last classroom of love is family. And as I read that, I had this complete moment of clarity about everything that our system has become. And everything that I said last week at the State Board, I thought about over the weekend, and I will repeat it again. I believe that testing is good for some things, but the system that we have created has become a perversion of its original intent. The intent to improve teaching and learning. The intent to improve teaching and learning has gone too far afield, and I look forward to reeling it back in. And I think we are on the edge of that, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So as I read this story, it occurred to me that our goals in life are not about the test, not about an AEIS report, not about a district monitoring or intervention. It's about how we treat each other. And I think that we have taken these tools that were designed to improve teaching and learning, and we've forgotten the true meaning of them. It's as if we are in our kitchen and we've mistaken the spatula we use to flip the burgers for the true meaning of the people that are inside our homes. It's time to put the spatula back in the drawer and focus on the people in our homes, and focus on our kids, and focus on our families. What matters most is how we treat each other. So where do we go from here? I spoke to you last year during the legislative session, and I told you, I stood on this stage and told you I did not stand in fear. And I do not stand in fear and did not stand in fear because I thought it would get better by the end of the session. And at this point during the session, we were looking at about $10 billion in cuts. And I told you I thought it would get better, and it did. It did not get completely better, but it got better. Um, and I recognize that the cuts that were made were personal. They were personal to me as well. They were personal to the regional service centers, and they were personal to you. And the fact that I was not able to get back every dollar, I apologize. But I did my best to get back every dollar that I could. The cuts at the agency were difficult. We had a 40% reduction. The cuts at the service centers troubled me most because that is the mechanism by which we enact policy throughout the state. And I was very concerned that I was going to have to close some regional service centers because of a 40% reduction in funding. But I'm pleased to report that I've just spent the last couple of weeks reviewing every service center and that I have found them in a remarkable state of being, that they remain vital and they will be able to continue to provide the services that our schools so desperately need. And I was very pleased to come to the conclusion that we weren't going to have to eliminate any. I will, however, say this, and this is one of the few points that I will ask you to take away from this discussion today. UIL realigns every two years. We have not realigned service centers in over 40 years. Now, if you think about that, with population growth and shift and demographic change, it is probably about time to examine the lines of service centers. So we'll be reaching out to school district personnel, superintendents, board members, and asking what your thoughts are on your service center. Now, most of you do this every year through your customer satisfaction survey anyway, and I don't expect to, to read any horrible things about service centers. I think, mo for the most part, people appreciate them. But in looking at lines that hadn't been redrawn in 40 years, we may have to look at population shift. We may have to look at that change and, and make some changes, but we won't do it independently. We want to do it with your input. Now, I mentioned the, the cuts at TEA, and I will also acknowledge the litigation that's out there. Now, as the defendant in the litigation, the, the rule of thumb is the best, the, the less said, the better. So, and my lawyer is on the front row here nodding to me. Um, so I will simply say this. I testified before the legislature that the amount of funding that they provided enabled the system to continue as is. As we move 
into implementation of end-of-course exams and STAR, I believe additional resources will be needed in the future. I'm being very careful, Counselor, how I say this. And I will tell you that the legislative appropriations request that the agency makes to the next legislature will reflect that. And I will say this as well. And this is going to get me in trouble with my attorney, but it's true, and the law says this anyway. And since I'm an attorney as well, we can agree to disagree, Counselor. I cannot and will not certify the ban on social promotion unless there are resources to provide interventions to students who need to pass the test. That is the law, and I cannot and will not do so unless those resources are appropriated by the next legislature. Now, I know a lot of you want to talk about the end of course exams, and I want to talk to you about that too. I spent a little time in counselor's office the other day, and I will tell you honestly that I asked my legal counsel if there was any way that for this year I could waive the 15% requirement. And I would waive it if I could, but the law will not allow me to do so. And here's why I would waive it. I would waive it in year one. Not because I'm an opponent of end of course exams, I think end of course exams are fine. Not am I, nor am I afraid of the fact that 15% counts for a final grade. But I believe in year one of implementation of an assessment system, we might want to give the system a little more time to understand what they're facing before we throw that into the mix. Unfortunately, I don't have the statutory authority to do that. But I would say, I would hope that, you know, I don't know if we can figure out some way, but I, I, all I say is that we're going to have to grin and bear it together. Um, and I, I share your frustration with this. It does not bother me that 15%. It bothers me that in this year that we're not holding districts accountable, that we're holding the students accountable. And I think that a little transition time would have been better for the system. Um, it's interesting, though, because uh, Representative Strama and I were talking beforehand, and we, we posed this question, and, and it's a fascinating question to you as well. What if the policy had been that we had had end-of-course exams for the past 20 years, and the exams had counted for 15%, and this was the standard policy throughout the system, and everybody had gotten accustomed to it, and everything was fine, and we knew exactly the answers to the questions on your mind today, and we decided we were going to reel it back, and the state wasn't going to invest in those end-of-course exams, and you all had to come up with your own end-of-course exams. I think the level of anxiety out in the field would be the same as it is with this new system. We just have a new system, and it's going to take some time to get used to. I think it will be good for kids eventually, but it's going to take us a little time. Um, I will say this as well, too. And I'm going to be, like I said, I'm going a little bit different today. I'm not going to belabor you. I'm not going to be, I'll, I'll be brief, and if, and if you all want to, I'll um, answer some questions. Um, I do think the most fundamental thing facing our state are the quality of educators we have in our classroom. And I was very pleased that we've started a new teaching commission not just to look at the appraisal system. I think that this national movement to look only at appraisal systems and appraisal systems only and appraisal systems only all the time is the wrong thing to do for educators. What you need to do is take a holistic look at the teaching profession from recruitment to retirement and everything in between and examine, yeah, and maybe the appraisal system does need to be reevaluated. PDOS is many years old. Um, but what we need to do is do something with our teachers, not to our teachers. And I'll tell you this for sure, what comes out of it will not be a black box that teachers cannot understand. They will absolutely have to know how they're being held accountable, what they're being held accountable for in advance, so that they'll have an understanding of what to do as they move through the system. Now, each year, I usually stand up here with a PowerPoint and I roll through a bunch of slides about student performance. And I could stand up here again and tell you about the vast increase in the AP participation, the increase in SAT participation, um, the record high math scores on the ACT this year, the fact that, again, our African-American and Hispanic students are at the top of the country in terms of math, and our Anglo students are at the top of the country in terms of science on the NAEP. And I could stand here and do that all over again, as I've done every year, and you will still not read those stories in the newspaper for some reason. I don't get it. These are great stories. They are the story of what's really happening in our public schools, and we never get to read them. So I have to stand up here every year and repeat it um, and say thank you for your work. And I'll also say that the graduation rates, as I've done for the past several years, the Texas graduation rate 
compares absolutely favorably to every other state. Interestingly enough, this was the first year that every state recorded, reported the NGA graduation rate. And uh, Todd, have they released that yet? No. I'll be, I'm waiting with bated breath till they release that because I believe it will show that Texas will probably be in the top 10 states in the nation with respect to graduation rates, notwithstanding what you read about us being dead last in terms of dropout rates because that is a census number and doesn't account for where the people actually came from or whether they actually even attended a Texas public school. So hopefully when the U.S. Department of Education releases that, it'll be a good day. Now, moving into next session. As I talked earlier, I believe the system is on the cusp of change. And let me be more specific. Chapter 39 of our education code is the section of the code that deals with sanctions of districts. It is where I become the mean old guy from TEA who sends in a monitor, who sends in a management team, who sends in a conservator, or God forbid, closes your school or your school district. In many cases, that system is effective. In many cases, it is not. And I have learned that potentially the better route in some cases is simply challenging a district to improve. And I'll mention a couple of examples. Several years ago, I was sitting at my desk and the mail came in for me to sign and there was a letter ordering closure of a small West Texas school district. And I had never been to this school district and I tried not to order closure of a school district I've never been to. So I got on a plane and I flew out there and quickly discovered there was nothing wrong with the school district. Their students were fine, their teachers were fine, they were serving their students properly, their facilities were fine, they had a wonderful distance learning lab. They were small and they were rural and they were broke. That was it. And so rather than just do the easy thing and say you're closed and annexed to a district close by, I said why don't we try something different? Get some assistance from another district or a service center. Have them do shared services arrangements. Help them with your budget. And, it, and as I was talking to the service center director that represents that district, I asked how that district was doing, and he said they're thriving, they have a fund balance, and they're just fine. So the difference between closure and non-closure was a signature away on my desk. And the fact that I was able to see, go out there and see the work that these people were doing changed my mind. I had another situation very recently you may have read about in the newspaper. I was basically told we need to close a school district. And I went to the school district, and the school district was not in as good shape. There was serious physical problems on the campus in terms of student safety and health that I saw. Mold, that type of thing. Um, science labs in, in desperate need of repair. And rather than simply annex them to another school district, which was on the list to do, when I started to read the comments of some board members from some of the other districts that said, we don't want those kids it made me realize that those kids might not be better served annexed to another school district. So I challenged that school district to a list of things that I thought that they needed to do to get their school district back up and running. And are there representatives of Premont ISD here? Anybody? I don't see anybody. Raise your hand. Anybody? Back over here. There's Ernest. <laughs> Ernest. I want to thank you and your board for accepting that challenge because I think you guys are going to make it. And I've seen the determination in you and your board and you will have every bit of help that I can give you in making sure that your district stays afloat and that you're serving your students to the best of your ability. Thank you very much. I think we need to re-examine Chapter 39 and I've talked to House members about that. And I think we need to rethink some of the interventions that we do, because in some cases they work, in some cases they do not. I also believe that next session there will be a backlash against standardized testing. Captain Obvious says so. Um, if you watch the vote on the House floor, a near unanimous or unanimous vote to, to ban testing for two years. Um, so I see that as, as something that is coming. And I'll tell you, I think that the work of the Visioning Institute and Senate Bill 1557 is going to provide us a mechanism to look beyond this next iteration of accountability to what's coming next. <laughs> now let me say this, I believe the system will change, but I believe it will change for the better. End of course exams when properly implemented and post anxiety will be better for the kids. So as we soldier on, 
even in the face of the adversity we're confronted this year, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity in Senate Bill 1557. We have an opportunity in the development of a new accountability system that focuses on what does a good fine arts program look like? What does a good career and tech program look like? What happens on every single other day in the life of a school besides testing day? We have a huge opportunity there to move the kids farther and better than we ever thought possible. And I do not want to blow that opportunity. Now, I'm not going to talk much longer, and I see they've put microphones out for questions. So I'm going to answer a question that was posed to me this morning. Where's Bonnie Kane? Bonnie Kane? Is she here? Bonnie's not here. All right. Well, I'm going to talk about her behind her back. She's here? Oh, there she's way in the back. All right. So Bonnie, Bonnie's been a friend a long time. And she walked up to me this morning and said, your clothes are falling off you. Why are you so skinny? And I, I, I told her I would try to answer that question. And I would say, you know, historically, I've always been skinny. <laughs> but I think that in, in my life, a, a, work, a work coach would tell you that I have serious trouble with work-life balance. And that I am skinny because I tend to put off taking care of myself until the rest of the work is taken care of, traditionally. But I also tell you that four and a half years ago when I took this job, I didn't understand the weight of it. And I didn't understand how a guy like me, with so many flaws and so many imperfections, and who has made so many mistakes in his life, could possibly survive in this job. And it has weighed upon me. And it's probably caused me to miss a few meals. Because when you get into that situation, it's a fight or flight thing. And I have been in fight mode for four and a half years. And I remain in fight mode. And every now and then I get frustrated and I say to myself, you know what, you've been doing this a long time. Maybe it's time to resign. And I think to myself, you know, I could go make money in the private sector. There's opportunities out there. And then Arne Duncan says he feels sorry for our students in the state of Texas. And the Irish comes out in me. <laughs> and I say, not just no, but hell no, I'm going to fight. And then I go along, and I, and I keep running, and I keep running, and I keep running, and I reach a point where I'm tired again. And I'm like, man, I could really do, do a job I could do on a boat in the Caribbean. Wouldn't that be great? And I'm thinking to myself, man, it might be time to go. And then Bill Hammond opens his mouth. And Bill Hammond says the agency is de you know, derelict in its responsibilities because it's not demanding that you do the 15% rule in another way. And I say, I'm going to fight, and I'm going to stay and fight. And it was put to me this way, and I was on the phone with a reporter, and it was a, a situation where she said, you've given a challenge to a school district, and they claim that you have asked them to climb Mount Everest. And I said, can we go off record for a moment? And she said, yeah. And I said, let me talk to you as a father. I said, if either of my children were stranded at the top of Mount Everest, and they were facing freezing to death or starvation, guess what I'm climbing today? I'm climbing Mount Everest. And I think that's the challenge we all face in these adverse times. That is a challenge each and every one of us faces in the times that we live in, given the standards that are increasing and the resources that we have. We got to keep climbing and we got to keep fighting. And Bonnie, that's why I'm so skinny. <laughs> but what does that mean in the end? What that means in the end is that when we are all ready to meet our maker, and we are laying on that bed, and that chaplain, that hospice nurse, and that pastor listens to you talk about your mother and your father and your son and your daughter. And they ask you, well, why did you spend so much time climbing? And you can honestly say, because the children were there. And that will be a life worth living. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Now, if I can put on the, uh, I don't know if the, is the lavalier working? Yes, can you still hear me? Okay, good. Let's have a chat. Questions? 
This is my favorite part of midwinter. Stump the commissioner. <laughs> it's been done before. Usually a math question, but anybody, anything. Otherwise, you're getting out of here a little early. I see some running for the door now. <laughs> That's OK. I'll tell you, when I, when I drove to work this morning, there was a slight film of moisture on the highway, which in Austin equates to people acting like crazy idiots on the highway. They drive at two miles an hour. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And so it took me an hour to drive 13 miles. But as I walked in here earlier, I saw that that fog had lifted and the skies had parted and it is a beautiful day out there. So if you want to leave here and go somewhere and enjoy that beautiful day, by all means do so. Otherwise, we have a question. Commissioner Kelly Moulton, Hereford ISD. Hereford has always been an early adopter in things. We had Blue Ribbon schools early. We had exemplary schools early. We are not as fortunate as that now and find that we are working harder or as hard as ever. And it's important to find the success in each child. And the testing system is not helping us meet that goal. What happens to me, what happens to our district when we say, no, we're not going to take the test? Well, you can say that. I mean, and, and, right. and, I, say, and I say the same thing <laughs> about the federal government. You know, what happens if I say I'm not reporting AYP this year? What happens if I just bury it on the TEA website? Because it's really not relevant. They admit it's not relevant. They're giving everybody waivers in other states because they say it's not relevant. If you, if you simply said we're not giving the test, I would say that there's, ways, there's a way in the future to do that through Senate Bill 1557 that would allow you to be that pilot. So I would ask you to explore that and not violate the law. Because if you violate the law, then Chapter 39 kicks in, and I've got to be that ugly guy that I just said I didn't want to be. So don't tempt me. <laughs> But work with me, because that bill, and I do think that is the way to go. And if we learn from that bill that we can do this system through sampling like NAEP, maybe that will be a better system. But we need to get through this first. Thank you. Other questions? Y'all are not talkative this year. You know, there have been years when I have come up here and gotten into debates about teacher terminations, uh, civil rights. And y'all are not that talkative this year. Well, I'll tell you what then. I'm going to invite Adam Jones up to say a few farewell words to the field. Because I'm on the hot seat all the time, and you're never on the hot seat. So come on up here and say a few words about your experience at TEA, Adam. I'm dead serious. <laughs> Over the mic. I have a room full of educators, and not a single one of you can ask a question. <laughs> um, I am uh, humbled by the experience I've had at TEA. Um, talk about an unplanned set of remarks. These are them. <laughs> I often tell people I am on the side of the house that has nothing to do with the education of children because you don't want me over on the other side of the house. You have smart, intelligent people making those decisions. Um, I often tell our new employees, one of my jobs is to talk to new employee orientation, and I point out to them that, that TEA is an enormous state agency, more money than any agency in state government. Now they're hitting the exits commissioner. But there are only about 700 people in the Travis Building. You know what you don't see at TEA? You don't see third graders learning to read in the halls. You don't see eighth graders learning algebra in the halls. You don't see 11th graders smoking cigarettes in the parking lot. <laughs> we can't do anything without you. TEA does not provide direct service to kids. That's your job. Uh, and every day, all we try and do is go to work and try and make the best decisions we can for kids and try and stay out of your way because God knows you're trying to make the best decisions for kids. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll always be honored that I got to do that. I'll always be honored that I got to work for these people 
and I'll always be honored to be on this team for Texas kids. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Y'all thought, thought I was joking about bringing him up here, but after you just heard that, you know why I had an absolute confidence. Because Adam, aside from being a great guy and a, and a wonderful employee at the agency, is also a wonderful person and a great writer as well. If you've not read his book, Rose Bowl Dreams, pick it up. Um, he also has a weekly uh, sports column on uh, college football, the Jones Top Ten. Look it up. Anyway, thank you all very much. Y'all have been great. Appreciate you.